Okay, perfect. So maybe I think we can actually begin, but because we have a pretty intimate group setting, if it's fine, we'll go around and introduce ourselves and then I'll introduce the, the, the keynote for today. So if that's okay, I'll begin. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Simon, I'm a first year medical student at McGill and uh, happy to be here, of course. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Pedro, uh, second year med student at UBC. Uh, also happy to be here and seeing you guys join. Yeah, hey everyone, my name is Mohammed. I'm also second year medical student at UBC and happy to have all of you here tonight. I can go next. I'm Sam, I'm a fourth year med student at the University of Saskatchewan. Um, and I apologize for the scrubs, I'm on call tonight. So if I have to run out, um, please excuse me, but happy to be here. No worries, welcome. Hey, um, I'm Nolan, uh, first year med student at U of A. I'm currently just studying for my uh, endocrinology final. So I'll just be studying away and listening to you guys in, in the background. Hi, I'm Emma. I'm a first year medical student at the UBC Northern Medical Program. Hey, I'm Peter. I'm a second year student at Queens. I think that just leaves me. Um, sorry, my camera is not working on the computer I'm currently on, but my name is Shira and uh, I'm a first year medical student at UBC. Okay, wonderful. So we will uh, proceed forward. And if any of you have any friends that are also interested in joining it on the spot too, feel free to let them know. So I will just uh, briefly introduce uh, CampSign. I, I know that we see some familiar faces from previous events, but essentially CampSign is a uh, an interest group nationwide dedicated to neurosurgery. And you know our really biggest goal is to connect and uh, sort of uh, provide a platform for people that are interested in neurosurgery to, to meet uh, really stellar individuals like Dr. Manoranjan among others. And uh, you know we will be doing a, later on a CARM sort of a debrief uh, with some panel coming up as our future events. And uh, our goal is you know, to have lecture series, journal clubs, meetings, mentorship sessions, et cetera. Okay, so without further ado, I will do my best to distill Dr. Manaranjan's uh, biography in a few seconds. Uh, surely he needs no introduction, but for the sake of formality, we'll do that. He's uh, currently a PGY2 uh, neurosurgery resident at the University of Calgary. Uh, he is a McMaster alumni all the way through. He did his undergrad in uh, health sciences at McMaster, and then he did an MD and a PhD at the same time, the same institution. Uh, he's quite a prolific researcher, and uh, I think uh, his mentor was uh, Professor Sheila Singh. And, uh, and you know, he studied the WNT pathway, and I think recently there was a paper in Nature Communications that was published. Uh, and uh, we're very happy to have him here. Again, he's uh, quite prolific in his research and his educational platforms and uh, mentorship. And uh, he's off of, uh, has been a recipient of many awards, including the uh, Canadian Medical Hall of Fame. Uh, a few years back, and we're very excited to have him lead our first journal club uh, for camp sign for this year. So, Dr. Manavanchan, the floor is all yours. Yeah, thanks, Saman, and uh, please feel free to call me Brandon uh, Dona. Uh, you know, you're, as a resident, you don't feel like a doctor on most days. I imagine as a med student, you probably don't as well. Imposter syndrome is pretty rampant. Um, but I think, you know, I appreciate you guys all being here and, you um, you know, taking the time out. Uh, I know some of you who are applying to CARMS, this is probably a stressful period. So, uh, so I really appreciate you guys taking the time out of your day to show up to this and, uh, and we'll get started. And the reason, um, so we chose metastatic brain tumors because um, there's kind of an art and a science to how we manage these uh, as with most things when it comes to neurosurgery. Um, so we'll go through kind of a brief overview of metastatic brain tumors and then, um, We'll uh, go through the study that kind of we that we had circulated, and then at the end we can hopefully have a discussion about it. But at any point, if you have any questions, feel free to stop me. And uh, and then at the end, you know, if you guys want to chat about neurosurgery, or residency, or anything of that nature, uh, more than happy to chat. So, um, so just some definitions to know um, when it comes to metastatic brain tumors. Um, so. There's, and you know, they can be a bit form, 
formula, I guess, formulaic, but um, they're pretty simple in terms of what they actually mean. So when we say that someone has a single brain met, um, all that means is uh, they've got uh, brain met, but that has no bearing on the extent of disease elsewhere in the body. So they can have a lung cancer that's still active and growing, but all it means is that now they've got a brain met. If you say that someone's got a solitary brain met, then that means that presumably their, their, uh, their systemic disease is now stable or in remission. And the only thing that's plaguing them is this brain met now. Um, when we say precocious brain mets, these are uh, patients who present with a brain met um, and we presume it's a brain met. And when we operate, it suggests that it's a metastatic tumor based on pathology. But when we try to look for a primary tumor elsewhere in the body, we can't really find one. Um, so, and th so you can kind of think of these as symptomatic brain mets because they wouldn't present themselves otherwise, um, unless, you know, they had a fall, they hit their head. Uh, for whatever reason, and then they got a CT scan, um, and it showed that they had a lesion in their head. Um, but again, you'd presume that fall was secondary. The fall was symptomatic of their brain mat. Um, synchronous brain mets are tumors that present at the same time. So someone shows up with a symptomatic brain mat, you scan their body and you realize, oh, they've also got a lung cancer or they've got um, metastatic cancer all throughout their body uh, and one spot of which is the brain. And then metachronous brain mets are um, uh, the ones where uh, we see more frequently where someone has a known history of a primary cancer and that's been treated. And then years later or a few months later, they present with another tumor. And now this time around that other tumor is in the brain. Um, and that's the vast majority of patients that we typically will see. Um, and then when we think about, well, where do these brain mets come from in terms of their primary location? Um, I'm, I'm sure, you know, many of you have probably read and uh, know the more common uh, lesions that will metastasize to the brain. So the lung, breast, melanoma, uh, renal cell carcinoma, and then the GI tract, so colon cancer. And then there's a handful of uh, cases where we don't really have a primary site that we know of. Um, and while lung cancer and breast cancer kind of make up the bulk of these tumors, uh, when it comes, when you look at the individual tumors as a whole, it's actually melanomas that uh, have a greater preponderance for uh, metastasizing to the brain. But overall, given that melanoma is a bit rarer than lung cancer, we see less of those. Uh, and then when we think of the CNS we're, uh, with neurosurgery, you also think of the spine. And so there's also uh, a kind of a different set of tumors that have a greater propensity to metastasize to the spine or the epidural space. And those include breast cancer, lung cancer, prostate, and uh, uh, lymphoma. So kind of how I mentioned earlier, you know, even though um, melanoma is not, you don't see the, the majority of cases are lung cancer that metastasize to the brain. There are a handful of tumors that for whatever reason have a greater propensity to go to the brain. And those include testicular cancer, melanoma, small cell lung cancer, choriocarcinoma, and germinoma. And then there's a handful of others that have uh, kind of, uh, there's kind of a spectrum in terms of their ability to get to the brain. Um, and then with uh, brain mets, one characteristic pattern is often we see multiple brain mets. So it's not just one tumor. Um, so ones where we typically will see one tumor are renal, breast, and uh, colorectal or thyroid. But ones with multiple brain mets are typically melanoma and lung cancer. Um, so those are just, um, you know, these are super broad strokes in terms of generalizations, but, uh, uh, and as with most things in medicine, um, there is no certainty and you can't really say, oh, like, if you see multiple brain mets, then it definitely can't be an, or like breast, it can't be breast cancer in terms of origin. That's not true. But for the vast majority, I think you can make that argument. Um, so clinically, how do brain mets present? And I think, as you can all imagine, uh, high ICP is kind of the big thing that we always think of. So, you know, symptoms of high ICP include headaches, nausea, vomiting, um, 
uh, and then focal neurological deficits, whether that's motor or sensory deficits. Um, but about one in 10, uh, I guess 10% uh, of patients will present completely asymptomatic. Um, and then about 20% will show up with seizures. And uh, patients with melanoma brain mets have, for whatever reason, a greater propensity for seizures. Um, and melanoma brain mets, um, I guess we'll get into them later, but they're also, they, they can also be known to bleed quite a bit. So that could also be a cause for their seizures. Um, and then just my next point there, um, some of these patients will present with an intracerebral hemorrhage that later when you get an MRI, you see that that hemorrhage is actually uh, resultant from a tumor lesion that bled. And there's kind of a uh, an acronym for remembering that, you know, often people will ask med students on electives and you just got to remember MRCT. So melanoma, renal cell carcinoma, choriocarcinoma, thyroid, and teratomas are the tumors that will metastasize to the brain and have a greater propensity to bleed. Um, so in terms of how we manage these patients, you know, we're surgeons and we often think about surgery, but there's always other options. And it's really important to think of other options in terms of how you manage patients. So one of the first things we often do with uh, patients presenting with brain mets is putting them on steroids. And the reason for that is a lot of these patients, uh, if you look at a scan of a brain met, there's quite a bit of edema and swelling surrounding the tumor. And so the steroids will help relieve that edema. And that usually patients, they're, they're symptomatic because of all that edema and swelling. So within the first 20 to 48 hours, some of those symptoms actually start to resolve because of the high dose of steroids we put them on. Um, now, depending on the center you're at, um, some center, I, again, I've, I've been at McMaster in Calgary, and I've always seen four milligrams every six hours. And I think for the most part, that's how uh, most centers will treat um, in terms of uh, uh, steroid management. But there was uh, a study, a single RCT, single center RCT that was done back in the day in 94 that showed just putting people on four milligrams of dexamethasone is the same as putting them on 16 milligrams a day uh, with fewer side effects. Um, but again, we tend to put people on four milligrams every six hours. Uh, and then for anti-epileptics, again, I think this is very staff preference based, but if you've got a tumor in the temporal lobe, for example, that you think has a greater risk uh, where I guess offers a patient a greater risk of seizing, then I think it's worthwhile to put them on anti-epileptics. But again, there isn't really good evidence to support that. Um, and uh, the other bit is based on the pathology. And, you know, if you know that someone has a known history of melanoma and now they're presenting with brain mets and your, um, uh, I guess your uh, suspicion for them having a melanoma brain met is quite high uh, and knowing that melanoma brain mets have a higher tendency to seize, then I think it's worth, it could be considered worthwhile to put them on an anti-epileptic. But again, no real strong evidence to support that decision. Um, so what are the goals of surgery for brain meds? Um, and so really, as with most intracranial mass lesions, it's to reduce the mass effect, um, get a diagnosis if uh, we don't know what the primary tumor may have been. Um, and then, you know, we always try to aim for improving patient outcomes. And in terms of brain meds, that's with improving progression-free survival or overall survival, and then maintaining their quality of life. And uh, even with uh, optimal management, um, unfortunately, median survival is quite limited. Um, and this, again, is with all comers and all types of brain mets, which ranges from 26 to 32 weeks. But that has improved um, depending on the type of brain met you look at and the type of mutation they may have with their brain met. So is there any evidence to support surgery in brain mets? And there, and kind of the big study to know is the Patchell study from 1990. That kind of set precedent for doing surgery when it came to brain mets. And um, basically what they had shown was doing surgery for single brain mets. So if someone only had one brain met um, and you treated them with whole brain radiotherapy with surgery, you improved their uh, median time to recurrence. Uh, or you improve their median survival, so 40 weeks versus 15 weeks, and their time to recurrence had also uh, been improved. 
Um, and then the important thing we always think about is functional independence. And I think back in the day, a lot of studies, the outcomes we looked at were, you know, are people surviving longer? And uh, so overall survival and the time between when that tumor came back. So uh, from surgery, so progression free survival. But nowadays, we're kind of looking at patient centered outcomes. So for some people, you know, overall survival or progression free survival may not matter a whole lot, but they may have other factors that really matter to them. So things like, you know, am I able to go back to work and stuff like that. Um, so uh, we don't have any recent studies looking at patient centered outcomes. But I think, you know, moving forward, we're going to be in a new era of assessing that as another variable in our endpoints. Um, and then the other important thing in brain meds is to know from the Patrol study was about 10% of patients with who they presume to have a brain med given they had a known history of a primary cancer that could have metastasized to the brain. 10% of those patients actually didn't end up having a brain met. It was some other type of brain tumor. So another reason to think about surgery with these patients is to get tissue diagnosis so that you actually know they have a brain met and you don't write them off and say, oh, you know, it's a brain met. They don't have that much longer to live or, you know, we should just treat them with radiation and uh, move on from there. So I think it's very important to uh, get tissue diagnosis um, even if uh, your suspicion might be high that it is likely a brain met. So what are the recommendations for taking these tumors out? Um, and you know, we'll go through a couple different uh, paradigms in terms of how we kind of prognosticate who should be operated on. But generally speaking, someone with a single brain met uh, with no leptomeningeal disease, and by leptomeningeal, I mean, uh, 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 metastasis or mets elsewhere to the meninges where, you know, you can't be operating on the leptomeninges. And until now, we don't really have any good medications for treating leptomeningeal disease. Um, there, there was a paper, I think last year or the year before from Adrienne Boré at Sloan Kettering, uh, where they, for the first time, it was published in Science, where they showed uh, you know, like iron chelators may be uh, useful in treating leptomeningeal disease. And it was a pretty novel paper. So there's some work now coming out in terms of how we can possibly treat leptomeningeal disease. But up until now, we really don't have a good way to treat it. Um, and then life expectancy. So assuming that their prognosis is greater than three months. Uh, if they don't have any uh, systemic disease, then that, that would suggest they have a better uh, potential for better outcome. And then KPS, we'll go through this, but the Karnofsky performance uh, score scale, um, we, re we use it heavily in oncology and it kind of gives us an idea of how well someone's functioning on their own. And a K it goes up by increments of 10 and KPS of 80, 90 or 100 would suggest that this person can independently function. And once they get into 70 and below, then they start to need assistance. So if someone's still independently functioning, then it's worthwhile to consider surgery. Um, and then assuming that the tumor is not radiosensitive, so surgery would still be needed. And then the other big thing is, you know, if you've got a massive brain met and uh, it's, uh, there's high risk for herniation and things like that, and the patient's very symptomatic from it, then again, something to really consider surgery for, uh, assuming that's in keeping with their goals of care and all. Um, so if all of those statements were true, median survival was about 10 to 12 months and their two-year survival was about 20%. And so here's that Karnofsky performance uh, scale. Um, so again, from 80 to 100, they're able to carry out their normal day-to-day -day activities without any additional assistance. And then as we go down from a score of 80 or from 70 below, that's when they start to uh, patients start to need assistance in their uh, daily activities, uh, which would suggest that you know their extent of disease is quite uh, significant. So what about, so that was operating on a single brain met. What if someone had multiple brain mets? Do we have any evidence to operate on those? And this is where things get a bit controversial. So there's a paper in 1993 in the JNS uh, from a big uh, cohort at MD Anderson where they operated on uh, patients with a single brain met, uh, multiple mets, or um, if they hadn't operated on any of the mets. And they looked at median survival. And they saw that if you operated on a single met or all the mets, uh, median survival was about 14 months. 
But if you operate it on none of them, it was only six months. So that kind of set a precedent that, you know, you should be trying to target all or trying to operate on all of these. Having said that, there have been several uh, subsequent studies which have not been able to recapitulate um, that difference in median survival or overall survival. So there, again, isn't strong evidence to suggest that you should. But if someone's got, for example, one big tumor in their posterior fossa that's causing obstructive hydrocephalus, and then they've got another big tumor in their left frontal lobe, for example, um, then I think, you know, it, it, it's worthwhile considering surgery of both lesions. Um, if they've got really small lesions that are, um, you know, less than three centimeters, for example, then, uh, you, you know, you can consider radio surgery or something else. So I think it's, uh, it, it's a case by case uh, decision. And, you know, all those factors that we discussed earlier, do they have systemic disease? Uh, what are their goals of care? And all of those factors also weigh into that decision making of whether or not you should be operating. So then with whole brain radiotherapy, that's kind of for the longest time and prior to um, the paper that we'll be discussing, whole brain radiotherapy was kind of like the all and end all and everyone was getting radi radiated. And while we know that it uh, improves progression-free survival, it doesn't really improve overall survival. And the drawback is there's significant cognitive deficits. Um, and so again, depending on the center you're at, at, in Calgary, we kind of will provide stereotactic radio surgery for a large number of brain mets. And whole brain radiotherapy often is only considered in palliative measures. Um, but again, certain centers don't have the luxury of having stereotactic radio surgery. So whole brain radiotherapy still is used in clinical practice fairly commonly. Um, and then depending on the tumor that, uh, depending on the pathology of the tumor, it may or may not be responsive to whole brain radiotherapy as well, depending on its extent of uh, radio sensitivity. Um, so what are the complications of whole brain radiotherapy? So again, I briefly mentioned, you know, um, the big things are people can be, um, uh, cognitive deficits are the big things, but we usually break it down into acute and chronic. So the acute things are people kind of feel lethargic, um, just irritable, like just very um, exhausted pretty much for quite some time. Uh, and then um, the chronic effects are things that we usually think of when we think of normal pressure hydrocephalus. So symptoms like, um, you know, they can have some cognitive deficits, they can be ataxic, so um, gait instability, and then urinary incontinence, kind of that wet, wobbly, wacky uh, uh, picture. And then stereotactic radio surgery. So it kind of came up and our paper kind of got at, you know, when and who should receive stereotactic radio surgery. And it's thought to really treat deep lesions that are in eloquent uh, regions that we typically would not want to be operating on um, in terms of, you know, there's certain uh, um, countries that really care about cost effectiveness. And, you know, we all do, but uh, it, um, definitely reduces hospital length of stay and therefore is a bit more cost effective. Um, and then in terms of uh, treating uh, radio resistant tumors, because you're giving such a high dose in a very focused region, it's able to treat these tumors that we traditionally thought were resist radio resistant based on whole brain radiotherapy. Um, but the disadvantages, and again, for someone like me, who's really interested in the basic sciences, one of the challenges is because we send so many people to get stereotactic radio surgery, we don't get tissue diagnosis. So uh, we lose out on no, really understanding the biology of these tumors. And so that it, to me is a big limitation. And then um, in terms of the tumors that we can treat, uh, we typically treat smaller tumors, so less than three centimeters because you want it to be focused radiation. And then uh, we'll get into uh, whether or not it's good for overall survival or progression-free survival in our paper. So having said all that, the natural history of a single brain met, um, so this is just median overall survival. So if you saw a patient in the eMERGE and you decided to not do anything, um, their overall survival would be one month. If we were to treat them with just steroids and anti-epileptic drugs, it'd be about two months, it would double. If we treated them with whole brain radiotherapy and steroids and anti-epileptics, it'd be four to six months. And then if we treated them with surgery along with all the other things and whole brain radiotherapy, it doubles again to about a year. 
Um, and however, in this particular cohort, all the patients had died by 21 months. Um, and again, this is kind of uh, a broad statement. Um, and nowadays with certain types of brain meths, we do know that uh, chemotherapy and uh, immunotherapy is a possibility. So now in terms of, you know, how do we manage these tumors and what are the prognostic factors? The big things we always think about are patient age, so are they less than 65, their KPS being above 70, extent of extracranial disease. So if it's only, if they only have brain mets, then that's great. And then the status of their extracranial disease. So if their systemic tumor, if their systemic primary tumor is in remission or, um, or they're doing well otherwise, um, and there's no new lesions, then, um, then, and if all those statements hold true, then median survival is about six months. And if we, if they're, if any, uh, if they're all negative, then it's only 1.8 months. And again, these are kind of like prognostic factors that we need to know, but on a day-to-day -day basis, you're not going to say, oh, you know what, you're over um, the age of 65, so I'm not going to operate on you. It doesn't work like that. And so, um, so that's where, you know, the art of medicine comes in and each patient is treated on a case-by-case -case basis. And this kind of just reiterates that, um, but those uh, parameters or prognostic factors were based on a big paper that looked at 1200 brain mets um, with, uh, from three different RCTs and they did uh, kind of a recur they did kind of a, a form of statistical analysis where they were able to identify these as the key factors to uh, correlate with uh, in, uh, clinically significant differences in uh, median survival. So with having said that, we'll get into our paper. Um, so this paper, um, you know, some of the authors on this paper are like pretty well-known neurosurgeons in the field of neurosurgical oncology. Um, and it, it's a paper out of MD Anderson um, where there are uh, uh, quite a few, uh, or they have a very large volume of cases for uh, brain meds um, and neuro-oncology as a whole. So we'll get, so the precedent for doing this paper was that prior to this paper, um, uh, as I mentioned with the Patchell study, so surgery, we knew that surgery for single brain mets uh, improved people, uh, patients' outcomes um, when you combined it with uh, whole brain radiotherapy. Um, so we knew surgery plus whole brain radiotherapy was really good and we need to do that. Um, and we knew that it reduced recurrence, but what we also knew was with the ad addition of whole brain radiotherapy, patients were having significant cognitive decline. So we needed to find a way to like really improve uh, patients' quality of life. And that's where steer tactic radiosurgery kind of snuck in and that, well, you know, you're giving very focused radiation and because there's minimal off target effects, then maybe we can reduce their um, cognitive decline based on uh, the management pattern. So the hypothesis for this study was surgery and stereotactic radiosurgery decrease time to local recurrence in brain mets versus surgery alone. So you can see they looked at progression-free survival or local recurrence and rather than overall survival. And, you know, we can kind of get into, is that clinically important because, um, does it matter that you know your tumor is going to come back in three months versus one month, but at the end of the day, you may still pass away at nine months, irrespective of uh, whether you got radio surgery or not. And so you know it's kind of a long, and this is where you know in the field of oncology, there's always the art of medicine involved, and every patient is a, uh, has their own personal wishes on what they find is clinically meaningful and what's uh, important for their life. And I think um, it's something that's really important for us as caregivers to really think about. So we'll go through how, uh, we'll go through the study and um, the way I kind of always approach uh, clinical trials when I read them is the PICO guidelines. So PICO, it stands for population. So you look at, you know, um, I guess initially you consider the study design. So how, what was the study design? You look at the population, then you look at the intervention. So what did they actually do? You, what was the comparison group? What were the outcomes and what was the time frame for the study? And if you kind of go through that approach for all the clinical trials you ever read, it kind of really helps you get a good understanding of well, what, what what's actually 
like the big things from this trial that I need to take away. And it sets the foundation for any discussion that you're going to have because you'll then tease out, well, these are the inherent biases in this trial. So for example, with the study design, this was a single center phase three RCT. Um, so randomized control trial, which is great. Um, single center, so, but again, it's at MD Anderson. So their volume would probably be the same as, you know, if eight of our centers came together. So again, things to consider. They use block randomization. So what that, with the block size of four. So what that means is, you know, theoretically, if we were to randomize people in a study, um, we would presume that we would get 50-50. If you were to flip heads or tails uh, 100 times, you would presume you get heads 50 and tails 50 uh, times. However, you could possibly get for like the first 50, it could all be heads. And then the next 50, it could all be tails. Um, so to prevent that from happening, what they did was they had groups of four and within those groups of four, they made sure that um, uh, two people were randomized to uh, surgery and two people were randomized to surgery with radio surgery. And um, then in terms of the treatment team, everyone um, except for the neuroradiologist knew which arm of the study the patient was allocated to. So it's really hard to do blinding with surgical trials, as you can imagine. Um, but depending on the context. So here, it was important for the radiologists not to know because they're going to be assessing the scans and whatnot after the fact. And then they stratified patients based on their histology. So melanoma versus non-melanoma, the size of the tumor, and then the number of brain mets. And then in terms of the population, so here KPS above 70 comes up again. Um, they looked at whether or not uh, the patients were MRI compliant. three brain mets. Um, and, you know, some of the important things to consider were they excluded anyone who had prior radiation to the brain, uh, anyone with prior resection of a brain met, and um, anyone with uh, 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 post-resection cavity greater than four centimeters, because uh, stereotactic radio surgery would be ideal for people less uh, with uh, uh, resection cavity less than three. So um, in terms of the intervention, so what were the two group arms of the study? So one was surgery plus radio surgery, and the other arm was surgery alone. Um, and that's, that was a comparison. And then what was the outcome that we really cared about? It was time to local recurrence. Um, so, and the important thing to take from that is local recurrence. So this is the tumor coming back in the surgical cavity, not tumor coming back elsewhere, but it within the surgical cavity. And um, uh, they define local recurrence as uh, seeing another tumor based on imaging uh, that enhanced on contrast uh, within the surgical cavity. And then secondary endpoints were time to uh, uh, recurrence elsewhere in the brain, so distant recurrence, and then overall survival. Um, and then in terms of the length of enrollment, so, you know, you can see how long these studies take and, you know, it's, uh, it's quite a laborious process. So from 2009 to 2016, they were enrolling patients. And then in terms of follow-up, they were seeing folks uh, five to eight weeks initially after surgery, and then every six to nine weeks for a year. Uh, and then they ended up doing just uh, ser serial MRIs every nine to 12 weeks until they completed the study. So when we look at study profile, the big thing that I always look for is, you know, how many people were screened of those, how many did they exclude, and then how many were actually eligible and how many ended up being randomized. And then from the randomized picture, the, like were there a ton of patients that were then ineligible or were we able to capture most of the patients? And then from that, were most of these patients in the study actually included in the analysis? And for the most part, all of this checks out. And I think those are important things to always look at in a study because you can start off, you know, you might read an abstract that says, oh yeah, we screened like 2000 people, but then the study itself may only include 50 patients. So then you're wondering, well, what happened to the vast majority of them? And that really limits the power of your study as well and the clinical value or clinical utility of it. 
And then we look at baseline characteristics. And again, it's always important to make sure that there aren't any gross differences, like, like obvious differences between your two cohorts uh, on factors that are clinically meaningful. So, you know, um, while age or gender may not play a major role, but um, age definitely does. And we definitely don't see a major difference. Type of primary tumor plays a big role. We don't see a big difference. The size, the number of mets, all of those things don't really appear to make a big difference. So for the most part, we can make the argument that both cohorts were, um, say, uh, were more or less similar. So then the big findings from the study. And um, so what they found was steer tactic radiosurgery, while it extends the time to local recurrence, so it improves progression-free survival, which we see here, there's no difference in overall survival, and uh, there's no difference in uh, uh, steer tactic radiosurgery preventing or prolonging the time to uh, someone developing brain mets elsewhere from where they had originally operated. Um, so that, like, that kind of summarizes the big take-home points of the study. So if we get into that a bit deeper um, in terms of numbers, um, so 48% of the patients in the observation group uh, developed local recurrence, but only 24% developed it in the stereotactic radiosurgery group. Um, and then when we look at median time to local recurrent, or we can look at 12 month, but this is pretty much the same thing. We see that stereotactic radiosurgery improves time to progression free survival. And then if we look at local recurrence, um, they, the, the group for the stereotactic radiosurgery at the time of analysis, they still hadn't reached their median time to local recurrence. So again, suggesting that it definitely made a significant difference but there is no difference in overall survival. So, and this is something we'll get into our discussion. So, you know, if you just, if you didn't get any radio surgery, you'd live for about 18 months with median overall survival. And if you did get radio surgery, then it was 17 months and was not significant. Um, and then in terms of distant recurrence, again, no significant difference between the two groups. So um, then they wanted to also figure out, well, are there any things that we can predict? Like when I see a patient in clinic or in the emergency department and I'm thinking about, you know, should I be operating on them and follow that up with stereotactic radio surgery? Is there anything that I can use to help me predict that this patient will have an improved, uh, uh, I guess will have an improved progression-free survival? And so um, one of the things that, again, from the study we know is stereotactic radio surgery. If you offer them stereotactic radio surgery, then you know that they're gonna have um, an increased uh, progression-free survival or local recurrence will be uh, reduced. And then depending on the size of the metastatic lesion. So smaller lesions had a greater propensity for um, improved local recurrence. And then lastly, overall survival, if someone had stable disease, then they uh, presume to have a better overall survival versus progressive disease. And that makes sense. If you've got cancer all throughout your body, then you know, your survival will be limited compared to someone who had stable disease. And then in terms of distant brain mets, um, if they, depending on the number of brain mets at presentation, so if you only had one brain met compared to if you had three brain mets, the chances of you developing another brain met is going to be much higher if you have more brain mets. So the major points of the study are stereotactic radio surgery will prolong your time to local recurrence but it has no change in overall survival or uh, you developing brain mets elsewhere in your brain. And uh, the, one of the big limitations of the study was this was all in the era of um, uh, quality of life endpoints. So they didn't really look at quality of life endpoints. And as I mentioned earlier, one of the major limitations of whole brain radiotherapy was cognitive impairment. So I think that was a big limitation with this study. And then the other big thing, again, this is kind of a nuanced topic, but uh, leptomeningeal disease, we mentioned it earlier, um, they showed that stereotactic radio surgery didn't really prevent leptomeningeal disease uh, post, if you gave it postoperatively. So there was some thought based on this study that what if you gave it preoperatively and then you operated on the person? Could you prevent leptomeningeal disease? And uh, there's some ongoing clinical trials looking at that. 
And so one paper that I didn't send out to you guys, but it was published in the exact same issue of Lancet Oncology uh, was looking at the effects of post-op stereotactic radio surgery versus whole brain radiotherapy for one to resected brain met. And what they found, so this was kind of the head-to-head -head comparison of stereotactic radio surgery versus whole brain radiotherapy. And they found that there is no difference in overall survival, um, but whole brain radiotherapy actually improved your progression-free survival by about 20%. Um, so while there's no difference in terms of how long you're gonna live, the fact that you, you might, um, your tumor may come in terms of recurrence, it, it'll take a bit longer for it to come back with significant with whole brain radiotherapy. And then when we think about cognitive deficits, the study showed that stereotactic radio surgery gave you an additional three weeks of uh, cognitive free uh, deterioration, I guess. So you had three additional weeks before you start to experience symptoms of cognitive deterioration with serotactic radio surgery. So we'll, um, yeah, so this is my last slide. So in terms of, you know, things to think about, um, this is where, you know, we have all these trials, but at the end of the day, it's always a case by case uh, decision and, um, you really have to present your patients with, you know, what we really know about one, the natural history of these tumors and what would happen if we do nothing versus a medical versus surgery uh, versus surgery plus some sort of radiation. Um, and then I, I guess the way I always think about it is we're very, we can be very particular on who we're going to operate on. There, there are those factors that we thought about in terms of them having stable disease, them being relatively young, their Karnofsky performance scale or score being pretty high. So these are patients, if we're thinking surgery, these are people that we think are going to benefit from, uh, at least in terms of their quality of life, they're going to have an improved quality of life with surgery. So if our goal is to improve their quality of life and give them some sort of clinically significant survival, uh, whether that's um, in terms of what's meaningful for them, how they define meaningful survival, not in terms of months, but in terms of, you know, time, uh, things that they can do and making sure that they're still functional, then I think the goal would be to provide as much as we can. And in that case, giving radiation would be a meaningful approach to uh, provide them with that extra bit of uh, functional, uh, I guess, provide them with that additional bit of time with uh, an improved functional status. Um, however, if we were to think of, well, what do we truly know about serotactic radio surgery relative to just surgery? We know that there's no difference in overall survival. And we also know that um, there's no difference in tumors coming back elsewhere in the brain, but it will pro prolong the time in which the tumor will come back to uh, the spot where you had originally operated on. And then what about with, radi uh, with whole brain radiotherapy? Again, no difference in overall survival. And while whole brain radiotherapy improves the time to, uh, improves the progression-free survival, um, it also comes at the cost of cognitive deficits. So it's kind of that balance of risk benefit where you have that discussion with patients. And um, nowadays, again, at Calgary, I think you know they'll do stereotactic radio surgery on a large number of brain mets. Um, so, you know, technology has improved as well. Um, but I think this study kind of shows us that, you know, there, while we have data to support one answer versus another, it really comes down to patient preference. Um, does um, having more time where you don't have your tumor matter a whole lot when you know that that will make no difference in terms of overall survival? Um, and I think that's always a challenging bit um, because in a lot of these studies with metastatic brain tumors, um, we always see there's an increase in progression-free survival, but then, you know, as you read the study, you realize there's no difference in overall survival and overall survival we think will be meaningful, but then we also need to think about their quality of life. Um, so if they're living longer, but they're living longer with a Karnofsky performance score of 20%, is that, um, is that something that that patient would be happy with? And I think, you know, each and every one of us would have our own answer to that. 
Um, so I think that's, so hopefully you guys were able to kind of come away with all of that. Um, and uh, uh, if you guys have anything that you would like to discuss, we can open the floor now. Thank you so much. That was uh, very informative. Uh, I had a quick question, a clarifying point. So you, you sort of mentioned before you went to the introduction in the introductory part that if you remove the meningioma and the dura, right, uh, that would uh, decrease the likelihood of the, the, the brain tumor recurrence. Now, what are some challenges with completely removing that area, uh, like, like on a, from a surgical standpoint? Uh, yeah, sure. So like we, so with, are you talking about meningiomas or brain? Right, and meningiomas and meningiomas. Yeah. So like, so with meningiomas, it's a bit different. There are two, these tumors are like very different in, uh, in terms of with brain mets, we know that, you know, just be, like brain mets, you'll see like a well circumscribed lesion. And even intraoperatively when you're taking it out, they're kind of often, they're kind of like a little ball that you can like scoop out. Um, but it's like a GBM, for example, just because you see a nice circle doesn't mean that that's all the tumor. We know for a fact, you know, our brain met by nature is going to be metastatic. So there's going to be tumor cells that you're not going to be able to take out. Uh, meningiomas are a different beast. So they're extra axial tumors, right? So they're not within the brain itself. They grow along the drug. And for the most part, um, uh, meningiomas are... Um, you know, they're WHO grade one tumors for the most part. There are, uh, there are smaller proportion that are atypical and tend to come back. And then there's uh, uh, anaplastic meningiomas that, are fair, that can be fairly aggressive. And um, again, like no real good way to treat those. Um, but I think like brain mets are like WHO grade four tumors. So in terms of um, additional therapy, these patients are all going to get radio surgery, whereas in meningiomas, you can just treat them with surgery alone, and people, patients should typically tend to do better. Um, but again, the challenging bit with meningiomas is where they grow. So, you know, these tumors are often, you know, at the skull base and things like that, and um, getting access to that entire tumor can be challenging. So if you leave a little bit back, then you know that there's a greater chance of recurrence or uh, regrowth of that tumor. Um, so it's a little different in terms of how you approach them, but I think, um, and, but I think in terms of just one being extraaxial, one being intraaxial and their WHO grading being different and how aggressively you're going to manage them is going to be a bit different as well. Okay. Thank you very much. Could I also have a quick follow-up from what you just yeah. said? Um, could you use, like, how, how, how does, like, Raman spectroscopy, like, sort of come in and differentiating between the normal cells and the cancerous cells? Is there any way to, like, resect more using yeah. that method? Or? Yeah, so, you know, like, I think we're all trying our best to figure out ways to improve overall survival and make a clinically meaningful difference for these patients. Um, and, have, and with that, you know, there's... Um, different compounds or different approaches to try and improve or maximize safe surgical resection. And so Raman spec is one of those options that people have tried to consider and look into. And I think we may still be in the early days of that. And um, uh, I know there's folks in Canada really looking into it and working hard at trying to improve our ability to use Raman spec. Um, Personally, again, I, I've only ever seen it once and that was as an elective med student, but um, uh, we don't use it in Calgary. And I think for the most part, the, the understanding is that we don't have strong enough evidence to suggest that it makes a clinically different, a clinically meaningful difference in terms of extent, to, in terms of survival. And I think the other important thing to think about when we always think about extent of resection, you know, we want to take out as much of the tumor as we can, but with that comes the risk that you're going to have more morbidity. So as you take out more tumor, there's always going to be the risk that, you know, now this patient's going to be left with more morbidity. And um, there's there comes a point where there's a trade-off where extent of resection will give you more time with survival, but with the additional morbidity, you start to lose that uh, additional uh, survival benefit. So it's kind of, uh, again, as with most things in medicine, there's that risk benefit profile to consider. Thank you so much. Brian, I have a quick question. Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, thanks for the talk. So there were some other Kaplan-Meier 
traces in the in the paper that specifically compared the sizes of the yeah. of the various Mets, and it kind of made me wonder. Uh, and then, furthermore, looking at like the supplementary data mm -hmm. that they had, do you think that their their treatment or their effect size was overestimated based on the strong effect that it had? that stereotactic surgery has on smaller Mets versus larger well, ones. Yeah. Yeah. hundred yeah, percent. I think that's definitely a possibility with it all. Um, and I think at the end of the day, that's why we limit stereotactic radial surgery to lesions that are less than three centimeters. Cause we know that, um, you know, that's where you're going to have your biggest bang for your buck. Um, but, and the other thing is, you know, it wasn't that large a trial too, right? It, they only had uh, 60 patients in each cohort and that's coming out of MD Anderson too, right? So, and considering how many years it took them to get all that follow-up and stuff. So, you know, kudos to them for being able to generate all that data, but also being cognizant of the fact that, you know, the study was still fairly small. Um, and, but it was appropriately powered to answer the question they wanted to answer. Um, but in terms of, you know, I harped on overall survival quite a bit throughout the paper, but their goal was not to look at overall survival. It was always a secondary endpoint, but you can make the argument that that should have been a primary endpoint um, because, you know, uh, pr again, progression-free survival, that's great. But if people aren't surviving longer then um, you know, what's like where, why bother sort of deal. Um, but so again, everything was done a priori. So you know that they weren't kind of like handpicking at results that actually came out positive for them at the end of the day. Um, but yeah, I completely agree that part of that effect size could definitely be contributed to the fact that they have more smaller tumors um, that were getting radiated. Yeah, actually, I want to also first thank you for the great presentation. I learned a lot myself, uh, but I have also two questions. The first yeah. question is that we talked about like the, the other uh, paper which is going to com uh, compare WBRT and, and SRS directly to get, um, um, like a head to head. But I'm wondering if there's any study that, that uh, discussed the combination of WBRT and SRS. What have, you know, does it like significantly improve the survival rate or not? And the second question I have is that in this paper, we noticed that they have certified the patients based on the tumor size and also the, uh, for example, the, um, uh, the, the number of the mets we have in the brain. But how about the location of the tumor? Is mm -hmm. there any significant difference in the survival rate if you look at the specific location or they're the same? Yeah, so good questions. Um, I think uh, one of the things I didn't get into in this paper was it, when someone ended up having local recurrence, um, they kind of left it up to the physician or the treating team to decide how they were going to manage that local recurrence or even the distant recurrence. So it, recurrent brain meds is kind of just, you know, a free for all. It's kind of like recurrent glioblastoma. There really isn't a good understanding of how to really manage these. Um, and so it, I, I think I had it, but they, it was kind of a whole mixed bag in terms of how the observation group and the radio surgery group were managed in terms of their local recurrence. Um, and so it makes it a bit challenging um, to really figure out, you know, if you were to give radial surgery and then give whole brain radiotherapy, um, what would those outcomes be? Um, the second study that I mentioned in terms of radial surgery versus whole brain radiotherapy, um, in that study, the recurrent group got whole brain radiotherapy, um, and then, but it was radial surgery initially. And uh, the whole brain radiotherapy group, they had whole brain radiotherapy, and then they had a radial surgery boost to that region. So I think that comes the closest to a level one trial. Um, and in that trial, they showed that there is no difference in overall survival, but you do see an increase in progression-free survival. Um, and then in terms of tumor location, Again, if it's uh, an eloquent tumor, then, you know, um, and I guess the thing to consider are if it's an eloquent tumor and if it's small in size, then radial surgery might be better than whole brain radiotherapy. If it's an eloquent tumor that's really big, then, uh, you know, doing a biopsy and then doing whole brain radiotherapy might be an option. Um, and then if it's something that's local, like super tentorial or post fossa, easy to access and surgery, but in terms of actual location and outcome, there isn't, there isn't a good, um, 
uh, way to really suss that out and know that, you know, because you have a left frontal versus a right frontal tumor, the left frontals do better. I don't think we've got anything to support that. Thank you so much. Yeah, I had a, a question as well, uh, but before I'd like to echo others uh, for the, uh, thank you for the wonderful presentation. Um, uh, so the question I had is uh, when I was reading the paper, they investigated uh, up to three METs mm -hmm. and uh, it got me thinking that um, maybe after like maybe four, five, six, maybe those folks, um, uh, maybe surgery is not even worth it to attempt to resect all those uh, uh, metastases. But I, I noticed that you mentioned that it's actually better to try to um, resect as much as you can. So um, is it... Um, the, I guess, um, is it the reason that they studied up to three meds? Is it because four, five, six, and uh, anything above four is, is extremely rare or? Um... Yeah, so we, we don't operate on anything. Like, so um, I, I, in terms of, you know, operating on Osme, I think I meant extent of resection. So you try and get as much oh, of that see. one tumor as you can, not that you're going to go chasing like eight meds because um, mm -hmm. then, you know, you don't want to like, you, it just isn't feasible. Having said that, I think um, earlier we were chatting about how, you know, if someone has like, you know, there, there's a patient I saw um, a while ago who had recurrent brain met and um, the patient had multiple lesions in her supertentorial area, but then had um, a very large lesion um, that was left uh, left parietal and another one that was very large in her, her right cerebellar area that was kind of pushing on her fourth ventricle and causing hydrocephalus and all of that. Um, so in that case, it is reasonable to think about operating on that cerebellar lesion and possibly that uh, um, left parietal lesion as well. Um, but again, it's because both those lesions were causing symptoms, um, but not to go after all the little ones like that would make right. no difference. Um, and then in terms of, you know, numbers, uh, we really, it, it kind of just comes down to, you know, um, we know that we can treat with stereotactic radiosurgery, we can treat as like, you know, if you go to Japan, for example, they'll do stereotactic radiosurgery on a very large number of brain nets. Uh, in Canada, we're a bit more limited, and I think it's center dependent as well. Um, so you can certainly do stereotactic radio surgery on uh, a large number of brain mets. You're not going to be operating on a large number. I guess when it comes to deciding whether or not to operate, if you have multiple brain mets, that really just comes down to, you know, are they symptomatic from these and are they very large? Um, if they're less than three centimeters, then you know that you, operating on it, you don't really need to because um, you can treat them with radio surgery. But if it's less than three centimeters and for whatever reason, there's a lot of associated edema and whatnot, you can treat them with steroids and see if they improve with steroids um, and then kind of revisit the idea whether or not you need to operate. The other thing we didn't mention is with stereotactic radio surgery, after radio surgery, a lot of these patients can have a lot of swelling and edema surrounding that tumor area. And that's something we always see. And that's another kind of beast in and of itself in that, you know, someone shows up into eMERGE having had radio surgery, maybe like nine, like maybe 12 weeks ago, and now has all this edema. And on the scan, it looks like, you know, do you know, can you tell if this is a true tumor recurrence or is this just all the edema associated with the radio surgery? And, you know, should you sit back and kind of wait or should you go in and operate? And I think that's a pretty tough call as well. And the one thing that I forgot to mention was metastatic brain tumor management is such a multidisciplinary team approach. Um, so, you know, you've got neurosurgery, radiation oncology, and neuro-oncologists involved. Um, although in terms of our medical oncology options, we're a bit limited in terms of what we can give patients. Um, a lot of that is dependent on clinical trials right now and trying to give immunotherapy options. Um, so yeah, so kind of a long-winded answer, but I think the, the gist of it is that you're not going to go in and operate on a bunch of tumors, uh, only the ones that are symptomatic. And we don't really have good evidence to suggest that operating on many makes any clinical difference in terms right. of survival. Great. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, no worries.
may I ask another quick question? I know time is over, but I have another mm -hmm. quick question. So I noticed that in this study, so they said that they just tried SRS within 30 days after the surgery, mm -hmm. but that could be like a one week after the surgery, could be like the entire yeah. 30 days. Yeah. Is there any, any, any different in the efficacy of this method, depending on the time after surgery you apply that? Yeah, yeah, you know, like, it, out, like you know, people have published on that. And I think, from my understanding, there is no real difference um, whether you do it a week or um, within a month. The idea is that you try and do it as soon as you can, but um, you also want to give the brain time to heal as well because there's going to be swelling and edema from surgery, and then you don't want to give them radial surgery and cause more swelling and edema related to that. And then the other big thing is you also want to consider wound healing as well. Um, so um, there's a few factors that go into that decision making, but by no means is giving them radio surgery the very next day um, versus, you know, a month later um, in terms of the actual tumor growth or uh, preventing progression or stuff like that. I, I, I don't know personally, but I would presume that that would not make a difference. How about having more than one session of SRS? In the same yeah, location. so there's this idea of hypofractionated SRS, mm -hmm. um, and again, it, we, you know, it, I'm not a radiation oncologist, so I'd be speaking a bit beyond my scope. But mm -hmm. as far as I know, um, they it, it would not be um, it would it would not make that significant of a difference um, in terms of whether or not you're going to give hypofractionated versus a stereotactic uh, one big dose. But, um, but again, I think there have been several sub subsequent studies looking at this. And at the end of the day, you know, you may see marginal differences in progression-free survival, but there's no significant difference in overall survival. Thank you. And then uh, if you guys have any questions about neurosurgery or just CARMS, I know some of you are applying to CARMS this year. Uh, we're ha more than happy to chat, um, but I also know it's fairly late for some of you. So, uh, uh, and I know some of you have an exam. So, uh, so by all means, uh, you guys are more than welcome to just peace out. Could you maybe give, if you were to, I don't know, I know it sounds like a cookie, cookie cutter question, but if you were to like look back now that you're a second year resident and yeah. you were a medical student applying to the CARMS, what are some key takeaways? What are, what are some things that either you wish you knew or you, like you feel you learned during residence that could have been valuable as a medical student? Yeah, you know, I think, you know, neuros I, I think I was actually chatting with someone about this today. Um, I, I was on call last night for the ICU and, um, and I was chatting with our fellow who was on with me. And I think one of the things that, you know, I'd urge everyone as a med student to consider is, um, you know, when you kind of think you want to do a certain specialty as a med student, you're kind of like, you've kind of, you've got blinders on and you're just like gunning for whatever that specialty is. And you're like, that's all you think about. That's all you want to be. You want to be in a neurosurgical OR. You want to do neurosurgery all day, every day. Um, and that's great. But I think um, you also kind of need to do the due diligence of really sussing out other specialties and making sure that and not from a medical perspective, like, oh yeah, you know, I really like to, uh, like, you know, uh, I love, uh, I don't know, I'm thinking of like, oh, like say you really enjoy um, doing transplant surgery. Like, yeah, like that's like, aside from all the medical stuff, I think it's really important to consider the additional factors that come with neurosurgery. Um, and by that, I think, that some of the things that are important to consider are the lifestyle. Um, and I think it's very hard to really appreciate that as a med student um, and even as a resident. Um, and I was chatting with one of our staff a while ago and he was telling me how, you know, he follows a thousand patients out in the community. And so when he's not operating, you know, of these thousand people, like there's several of them getting scans every week and he needs to like keep on top of all those scans, make sure that they're not getting recurrent tumors and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And um, I think those are, and that's, that's one thing. Then there's all the additional paperwork. There's the teaching responsibilities. There's the surgical stuff, your clinics, and then there's the research stuff. Um, so those are all added pressures that, 
I think when you're in the neurosurgery bubble, that seems like the norm. It's like, oh yeah, that's the norm. That's what we should all be doing. But when you kind of start to look at other medical specialties and you see what other specialties can be like, I think some people, that's where you kind of get people who may realize, oh shoot, you know, I didn't actually know what I was getting myself into and I wish I had looked into other things. Um, and I know I'm probably preaching to the choir right now and you guys are like, oh, whatever, I'm still going to do neurosurgery. Uh, but, uh, but at least when you're a junior resident and you kind of get that aha moment, you'll be like, oh yeah, that guy kind of mentioned that to me a few years ago. Um, and again, I think that's totally fine to kind of reflect on that. And by no means should that tell you, make you feel like you shouldn't do neurosurgery. But I think um, the sheer amount of work is really important to appreciate. And um, like, I'm not someone who's like, oh yeah, neurosurgeons, like neurosurgery residents are the hardest working. Like, I don't believe that. I think, you know, every specialty has resident, like everyone works hard and, you know, what, um, like for me being on call on neurosurgery is exhilarating. If I were to do internal medicine call, I'm usually way more exhausted after that than I am from a neurosurge call shift, just cause like the cognitive thinking that, in, that I need to use for internal med, it like just drains the crap out of me. Uh, so, uh, so again, I think, you know, everyone's a bit different in terms of what you enjoy and uh, what gets you going and the things that um, aren't as enjoyable. Um, so yeah, I think I would really stress the importance of um, really thinking hard about um, making sure that you enjoy all aspects of the specialty. And I think as a med student, um, spending time with staff outside of the OR, going to their clinics, getting a better sense of, you know, what is their actual week like? And actually chatting with them about that stuff uh, really will give you some insight. And then, you know, we always say spending, doing call with the residents is a great way to get a sense of, you know, how busy can call get. Um, and cause often, you know, just showing up to the OR and then going home doesn't really get you a, give you a good appreciation of it. Um, but I totally appreciate that as a med student, you know, you've got so many other responsibilities as well. And, uh, you also want to come out as a really good doctor at the end of the day, uh, and you're going to have six years to learn how to be a neurosurgeon. So, uh, uh, you also want to train to become a really good physician to look after your folks. Um, so. I think, um, and your folks being your patients, not your parents, um, but you can look after them as well. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, so I think um, I, I would stress that. And, uh, and again, I think the other important thing is in Canada, especially in Canada, we're so like academically driven in neurosurgery. And by no means is that uh, what everyone needs to strive for. Like we definitely don't need like, in a given hospital, you need people who are pure surgeons and clinicians and you need people that are academics and that's the best way to go about it. So I know some, I've chatted with some med students who are, are kind of like, oh, you know, I don't really want to do research and that's totally fine. I think, um, uh, you know, it's really important to have people that, like to have that level of uh, uh, introspection to know that, you know, that's not what you want to do, but you do really enjoy the surgical side of things. I think all of those things are really important. Um, and the vast majority of us are going to end up in uh, community neurosurgery too, right? So, uh, and likely in the States. So I think being open with uh, the possibility that you're going to be moving uh, around um, quite a bit, I think those are things that as a med student may not hit you, but then when you start to have kids maybe as a resident and things like that, those things kind of become more and more apparent and more important to consider. Uh, so yeah, so I think those are little things, but can definitely go a long way. Um, and then I think the other big thing is having a really good support system. So uh, having friends and parents and loved ones that really like are supportive of what you're doing because uh, it, it can be, you know, the days can be really long um, and, you know, as with anything, you're going to deal with challenging personalities at times. Um, but uh, so I think um, knowing that, you know, you can go home and like de-stress and like chat with people who can like support you throughout your journey. Those things are really important and I can't underestimate, like, uh, I guess, uh, uh, just underscore how important that stuff is. That was okay. an amazing story. Yeah, just going to ask a quick question, like a, a more specific question. I'm, I'm wondering uh, if you, for someone who is interested in neurosurgery, what kind of electives do you recommend for the fourth year? 
Yeah, yeah. So I, I don't know if you guys get electives in first year, um, but I, again, I, I, every med school is a bit different. But you know, I think it's important to, um, like, like I mentioned earlier, like check out other specialties as well. Like, like it's, uh, like for me, I was really interested in urology, which again is totally different from your surgery. But I really enjoyed like the group of people that went into urology. Like it was just like a really fun group of people and uh, I loved it, but, uh, but I didn't really like the bread and butter cases. And I think that was kind of the selling point for me and that uh, I really like neuropathology as well. Um, and I just found uh, it to be a lot of fun, but I definitely miss the patient encounters. And I think that was something that was missing for me, but in terms of research and stuff, I thought it was a phenomenal specialty to be in. Um, so I think, um, you know, there's, like the way I went about, you know, everyone has their own approach. Some people from day one know they want to do surgery. They just don't know what kind of surgery they want to do. So, you know, you try out all the different surgical specialties. Um, other people go through it knowing that they want to do something neuro related. They just know what. So whether that's uh, adult neurology, pediatric neurology, uh, neuropathology, neurosurgery, or uh, neuroradiology. Um, so I think, you know, there's different ways to go about it based on what you feel is more of your inkling. For me, I was more on the neuro boat, um, I guess, except for urology, but that was more just personality driven more than anything. Um, but I think, so I kind of, I, like I didn't really look into other, many other surgical specialties. For me, I kind of went looking through a bunch of the other neuro specialties mm -hmm. um, and kind of uh, knew. And the other big thing is having really good mentors plays a huge, huge role, especially with neurosurgery. Um, so I think that obviously made a difference for me. Um, but yeah, so I would say, you know, you could definitely go about trying other surgical specialties or try other neural specialties and see which one kind of gets you more, like more excited every day to be at work. Thank you. One, uh, super quick question. Yeah, yeah. We're talking a lot about a, a, a lot about a work life balance. Yeah. Um, how many hours did you work last week? Oh yeah. So, <laughs> well, it was good you're asking last week because I was actually on neurosurgery. Um, so, uh, hold on, let me look at my calendar actually, because <laughs> I'll know which days I was on call. Uh, Just a rough number. Yeah. Okay, one sec. Um, so I was on call Tuesday, Friday, and Sunday. Um, so then. Uh, so let's do some math here. So Monday would have been like six to six, I guess. Um, so 12, uh, 12. And then um, that was like 30. Yeah, let me just pull up my mental math skills are, I'm post call today. So my mental math skills are pretty garbage right now. <laughs> Um, here, we'll do some quick math, 12 plus 30 plus 12 plus 30. So 114 roughly, but I was on call three days, right? Um, so, you know, in Calgary, like we're really good about like going home post call and stuff, but you also like, like for me, I had a busy night on Saturday, on Sunday, um, where there's a lot of, uh, like it was fairly quiet and then all of a sudden it just blew up uh, and uh, early in the morning it blew up again. So um, there was just a lot of stuff to clean up afterwards. Um, and so that like, you know, but usually, um, yeah, I think, you know, if you're on call three times in a week, then that's pretty reasonable. Um, and again, I think, you know, work-life balance, it's tough, like, but by no means do I have it figured out, um, and I'll be the first to admit to that. Um, you know, you come home, and for me, like, my options are I sleep, I uh, do some research, I study and read, um, I spend time with my wife, or um, I... Um, or I just like do some sort of physical activity, like go for a run or something like that, right? And you know, you by no means, like I can't, I'm sure there are people who can do all four of those or five of those and uh, do be really good at it, but I certainly can't. Um, so uh, for me, the way I break it down is, you know, like I pick two or three of those uh, each time I'm post-call. Um, my wife is usually in all of them, but uh, but then uh, you know research, studying, working out, like you or sleeping uh, and sleep. You know I try and take a little nap here and there, um, 
but uh, but I'm also someone who, um, if I sleep post call, I'm like the rest of my day is kind of messed up. I'm very groggy for the rest of the day, so I typically will just go to bed a bit earlier in the day um, rather than uh, coming home and sleeping. Um, so everyone's a bit different, and they manage it a bit differently. Um, but I I agree, like that work life balance. I think those are the little those are the big things that you don't really appreciate as a med student. Um, Whereas, you know, my buddy who might be in another specialty may not have that level of um, uh, like those work hours, for example. Um, so, and that stuff, you know, when you're a bit younger, you don't really care about that stuff. Um, and, you know, we don't have kids, but I definitely know that if I had a child at home, like, you know, that's a lot of time that I could have spent with my kid. And, um, you know, you definitely want to, like, everyone's a bit different. Like some people, you know, neurosurgery is everything. Um, and I think, you know, I, you know, I definitely care about it. I have a huge passion for it. And I love the research. But, you know, you also want to be there for your family and being present for your kids and stuff. I think that all of that's very, very important. Um, like, I remember during our CARMS tour, one of the questions we got asked was something along the lines of like, you know, would you, um, would you like want to stay and operate on an aneurysm or like spend time with your wife or whatever, something along those lines, I think. Uh, and, you know, some people may want to stay for that aneurysm case. And some people may say, you know, there's always going to be another aneurysm to clip, whereas, you know, with my wife or whatever, tomorrow may not be promised or whatnot. So I'd rather be spending home, spending time with my loved ones. And, you know, there's no right or wrong answer. I think everyone's got to make that personal decision as to what they feel is most valuable. Um, so, yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right, if there's no other questions, um, if you guys have any others, by all means, like shoot them away. Uh, no, uh, there's no stupid question by any means. <laughs> no, thank you so much for, for being here. We know also given that you work 114 hours of the past week. Oh, you got used to it. Don't worry about you guys <laughs> will all get used to it. I'm sure as med students, you guys work, like I remember as a med student, you'd be on call or post call and stuff. Uh, so, uh, and especially, this year more than, or I guess this year it's a bit different for all of you guys. So, um, but yeah, um, but yeah, enjoy your time as a med student. It's a lot of fun. Um, but, uh, and residency, I found, I find residency to be way more fun. I think the level of autonomy you get and stuff like that is a lot of fun. Um, you know, R1 can be a bit scary just cause now you have all that responsibility, but the one thing you learn quickly is you've got so much support to back you up by, and by no means it might feel like you're alone on call, but you've got a ton of people who are there to like really quickly get there to back you up. So I think um, always remembering that, um, that, you know, it's still a team sport, even though sometimes it may feel like you're on your own. Um, there's always a lot of people there. Great. Thank you so much again for being here and uh, all, right, cool. all your insights. Yeah, thank you guys for taking the time and uh, good luck. And hopefully uh, we'll see you guys uh, again, or I'm sure we'll see you on the Carnes tour in a, <laughs> or a few months or so. Yeah, thank you so much. All right. Thank see you, guys. you very much. That was really informative. Thank you. Yeah. Have a yeah. great night. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, everyone, you. for joining thank us. You. Bye, everyone. Thanks for joining. Bye-bye. Take care. Have a good night. Joining you.